platforms and tools. Her experiences ranges from a course development to program design and administration, as well as standard alignments and accreditation reviews. Uh, Susan's interest includes uh, new technology and economic development, supply chain and ideas for community and economic development, creativity and innovation, leadership, apocalyptic narratives, um, innovative literature, um, Spanish, Russian, Spanish and Russian literature, arts and humanities, history and uh, philosophy of science. And so welcome to Susan. Uh, next we have Mr. Kevin Ramnerin. Uh, Kevin is a former Minister of Energy and Energy Affairs of uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Under his tenure, he was credited with opening up Trinidad and Tobago's deep water acreage to exploration. In total, nine PSC were signed with uh, BHP and its partners. Arising out of these nine contracts, BHP conducted the largest ever 3D seismic survey conducted by an international oil company. Uh, prior to being appointed energy minister, he held uh, positions in the energy chamber and at uh, BG, where he worked as the lead economist for the East Coast Marine area. Uh, he currently holds a BSc in chemistry, uh, master's in petroleum engineer, petroleum engineering, sorry, and uh, international MBA. He's also a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Um, so welcome to Kevin. Uh, next we have Professor Carly. So John is a professor of petroleum geology and engineering at the Australian School of Petroleum, University of Adelaide, and holds the South Australia Chair, State Chair in Carbon Capture and Storage. He's also an adjunct professor at the Institute of Technology, Bandung, Indonesia, and a visiting professor at the University of Technology, Petronas, Malaysia. John previously was the inaugural head of the Australian School of Petroleum, and earlier he was uh, the director of the National Center for Petroleum, Geology, and Geophysics. He is presently the principal advisor to the Cooperative Research Center for Greenhouse Gas Technologies, having served earlier as the storage program manager and chief uh, scientist. Uh, prior to academia, John spent 18 years in the petroleum industry in both uh, technical and uh, managerial roles with Shell, Arco, and uh, Vico. He has received numerous awards, including Distinguished Service Honorary Member and Special Commendation Awards from the AAPG, and was a APG's international vice president and recently a candidate for a president. He is presently the chair of the APG's House of Delegates. Uh, he's also a SPE distinguished lecturer and has served as a distinguished lecturer for several organizations, which includes APG, IPA, and um, PESA. He's also the author and present of a whole of over 150 journal articles and technical conference papers. So uh, welcome to Professor John Carley. Thank Next you. we have Ms. Lynn Anderson. Uh, Lynn is a petroleum geologist with over 20 years of experience in exploration, development, and operations. Uh, Lynn is currently the manager of geology and geophysics at uh, Touchstone Exploration. She has worked both conventional and unconventional reservoirs uh, CBM, CSG, shale gas, and tight sand reservoirs uh, domestically and internationally. Uh, present and most recent experiences in Trinidad, and she's also an active supporter of the EAPG YPTT. Uh, so welcome to Lynn. Um, next we have Ms. Nisha Ramdas. Uh, Nisha is a passionate energy analyst from the Trinidadian Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. She graduated from the UWI St. Augustine with a BSc major in environmental and natural resource management and a minor in entrepreneurship. Uh, Nisha has developed a keen interest for energy policy and the issues surrounding them, which led to her pursuing an MBA in sustainable energy management. Uh, Nisha's desire to educate, on, educate the public on the energy sector led her in the unique direction of becoming a modern energy blogger, 
she has established and developed a personal energy blog uh, named Energy TT, through which she writes and breaks down the energy sector for Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, lastly, we have our moderator, Mr. Javed Raza. Uh, Javed is currently the, the director of the energy segment at Rams Logistics, which includes oversight of all business development, tenders, and contracts for upstream and downstream activities across Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, and Mexico. Uh, major projects include Exxon Massive uh, Lisa Field Development, exploration in the port of Suriname for Cosmos and Tolo, uh, Total's 2019 exploration well in French Guyana, and Tolo's recent successful campaign in Guyana. Uh, Javed has a BSc from uh, UWI St. Augustine in Petroleum Geoscience and a Master's from the Aberdeen University in Oil and Gas Enterprise Management, where he specialized in oil and gas taxation. He spent three years at the Ministry of Energy as a geophysicist. Uh, here he worked on approximately one dozen offshore and onshore seismic surveys including the then largest offshore 3D survey uh, ever done in Trinidad and Tobago, ultra deport acreage. Uh, Javed has served on the board of the aapg TT and is currently an executive member of the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago. He has presented several and at several energy conferences in the U.S., Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname, and Mexico. So um, welcome to you, Javed. So Javed, it's um, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. You're probably tired from reading all those bios. So we have right now 43 people online, which I think is great. That is probably more than we get in most talks that we have here in Trinidad. So I think that that's a, that's a really good start. It seems as though we have good connections with everybody. I hope, hope everybody who's listening can hear us pretty clearly and you can see us as well. So the plan, our plan is that we have five topics that we want to have some brief discussions on, right? And, and the panelists agreed to discussions before. Um, so the first one, I'm going to read out the five, and then we're going to spend a couple minutes on each one. Um, and we're going to try to keep this discussion to an hour, all right? And um, I, I would say that anybody in the audience that wants to discuss or has any particular comments or questions, you can type it in on the, um, on the, on the chat box um, that you'll see. So first question that we want to talk about, the first topic, is did the COVID virus contribute to a drop in oil price, and if so, how? Uh, the second one would be, what are the short and long-term implications of the virus on the energy sector, right? And some examples of how they affect staff in the office, how they might affect layoffs, um, services sector, drilling offshore, and stuff like that. Uh, the third one, impact the university students and young professionals over the next year or two? Will there be opportunities? Will there be new opportunities? What will be, what will be their future looking like um, coming up? Um, number four, what, what role has technology played in oil and gas companies in the last few weeks, last couple of months, based on what we've seen? Um, how, you know, especially if we, if we want to ask the AAPG, the AAPG reps how, how technology, especially in GNG, has changed or has it changed at all? And then as a fifth point, we want to just have a couple positive comments, a couple possible solutions and some suggestions for everybody who works and, and, and studies in this sector and things that we might be able to actually do going forward. So if that's okay with you guys, um, I just wanted to ask uh, everybody, so one by one, if you can just say uh, what time it is and where you currently located. So I'm in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it's currently 5.45 p.m. Um, I know Kevin and Nisha are also in Trinidad, same time zone. I'm not too sure about the rest of you guys. This is Denise, this is Denise Cox, and I'm in Panama City, Florida, and it, it is currently 4.47 p.m. Now, this is John Caldy. I'm in Adelaide, South Australia, and it is now 7.15 in the morning. And I'm having a cup of tea. Cheers, all. <laughs> um, this is Susan. Oh, sorry. This is no, Susan no, Nash. No. I'm in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and it's 4.47 p.m. Yeah. And hi, I'm Lynn Anderson, and I'm in um, Mabel Lake, uh, British Columbia. It's quarter to 3 uh, p.m. 
All right. So most of us, it's it's Tuesday, and I think for John, it's Wednesday, right? It is indeed. Okay, great. So and let, Wednesday is a beautiful day. You guys will look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, John. So so I, I I don't mind asking Kevin to get started. Kevin, did did the COVID virus start this fall in oil prices that we're seeing, or how has it done that? Did Kevin leave? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to somebody else in the meantime. Sorry, 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 I'm here, I'm here. Okay. I had, I had muted the mic. Um, yeah, to answer your question quickly, in December 2019, um, Oil prices, West Texas Intermediate, averaged 60 US dollars a barrel, and all was apparently pretty normal. Everything was, you know, going fine. And then towards the end of 2019, the first COVID-19 or coronavirus case was diagnosed and, and in China. And then come January, we begin to have the shutdown of parts of China, and oil demand starts to fall and prices started to fall. In early March, OPEC reacted to that by meeting on the 6th of March with a proposal to cut production by 1.5 million barrels of oil per day to support the market and to prevent prices from slipping even further. What happened is that that proposal by, by OPEC to Russia was rejected, and Saudi, Arabia, Saudi Arabia's reaction to that was to increase their production and to, to, to start a price war with the Russians. Um, and then COVID-19 really attacked the United States and parts of Western Europe, and demand fell even further. So there had to be another OPEC meeting, which happened, as you know, last week, Thursday. And the outcome of that meeting, it took over three or four days but the outcome of that meeting was that OPEC would now cut 10 million barrels of oil per day. So whereas three weeks ago they had refused to cut 1.5, they found themselves having to cut 10 million barrels of oil per day about two and a half weeks later. The world had fundamentally changed in that space of time between those two OPEC meetings. And that cut was supported by a 5 million barrel cut from other countries, including the United States, those commitments are not as, not as defined as the 10 million. Those commitments are more based on the, on the action of market forces. But to, to the answer your question, it's really a function of two things happening at the same time. Um, one was OPEC's, you know, sort of reluctance to, to cut production on the 6th of March, and the other one is the, the, the progressive spread of COVID-19 from China to Western Europe to the United States. So it's really, it's a, a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous demand shock. Um, as we know, in the month of April, depending on the source that you, the source that you, you read to, depending on whether it's IHS market or whether you're reading from, from, from a, another source or from the U.S., Energy Intelligence Agency, demand is going to fall anywhere between 15 to 30 million barrels of oil per day for the month of April only. We, we, of course, that's going to spill over into May. So we are in the middle of the storm right now. April is a pretty bad month for the oil industry. Uh, it's probably it is the largest fall. Let's put this into perspective. It's the largest, the second quarter of 2020 is the largest fall in oil consumption in the history of the oil industry. Mm -hmm. In our lifetime, there is no precedent to this. The closest that we come to this is the first quarter of 2009 during the subprime mortgage crisis. I don't know if anybody on the panel was alive in the 1930s. Um, please say so. Um, but I wasn't alive in the 1930s. But Something similar happened in the, in the 1930s in the Great Depression, but um, data on global oil consumption is difficult to come by for that period. So this is really unprecedented, and we'll talk more about how companies are reacting to this.
Thank you, Kevin. Very comprehensive um, overview on, on the oil price crash. I don't know if Denise wants to comment on, on that as well. I, I want to thank. It was a very good overview of, uh, of the factors that have contributed to the fall in price. And, and I think I'm going to pass for now because we're short on time and other topics. I'd like to reserve my time for future questions. Thanks. Okay, good. So I, I think um, if everybody's okay, I mean, Kevin pretty much answered that question. Um, and the demand will be the lowest, hopefully, in April, and we'll see how it spills over into May and the other months. So um, Actually, wait, I, I, I do actually want to make one comment. I do want to pause here to realize that this is a real-time experience on anthropogenic effect on climate. In one month, we have decreased significantly the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I think this is a good way to capture this moment in time of the good that we can do when we all work together. That's my positive spin. Okay, thank you very much, Denise. So let's let's go into the meat of the matter, right? Which is what are the short term, and then what are, do we think are the longer term impacts on the energy sector? So we, we you guys can can look at it from any point of view that you want to, whether it be hiring policies or actual drilling offshore or the services sector or um, work from home or anything like that. So uh, Susan, do you, do you want to start start that uh, topic? Um, oh wow, okay, that's a tough one. <laughs> I think that was going to be quite interesting um, because of the price um, collapse. We'll see a lot of wells being shut in, especially gas and um, shale. So I think what we're setting a stage for is, is a, a, a price recovery in at least a, a year or 18 months out. And I think also um, what we'll see is as potentially a pause on the electrification or decarbonization of, of the U.S. in terms of installing transmission lines and um, solar and wind except for local. So we might see a, a boost in natural gas generated electricity because I think we'll see a lot more demand for electricity as, as people have gone and become comfortable with um, working remotely and, and distributing, which requires a lot of electricity. Yeah, uh, this is John here. Can I come in on, on that a little bit to your question? Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. So um, I'm going to address the, uh, you know, the, the workforce issues and hiring. I uh, teach students who are looking at what's going to happen to their careers or their future careers. I'm also dealing a lot with young professionals in the industry, many of whom are losing or are worried about losing their jobs. So first to the students. Students and young professionals, you know what? This is an opportunity. What's this an opportunity for? This is an opportunity to actually delve into topics to hone your skills using a lot of the number of online resources that have come across to me on the emails recently is phenomenal. You know, just to the richness, the amount of stuff that I can get online for free. What a great opportunity. Nearly everybody's giving this opportunity. The other thing is, you know, when this is all over, and it will be over, this is about the fourth one of these downturns that personally I've been through. I know Denise is about the same. We've been through. And, you know, we are going to come out of it. And you know what? The recruiters are going to ask you guys, young professionals and students, hey, um, what did you do during the coronavirus? And if you say things like, oh, I spent a lot of time watching Netflix or um, huddling with my family, you know, that's not going to cut it. They're going to see where the real, you know, entrepreneurs are. They're going to see where the people that can really step up in a time of crisis. Those are the people we want to have in our industry. So view this, I think. Most people should view this as an opportunity, and I'll leave it at that. 
Thank you very much, John. And um, Lynn, I wanted to bring you in to ask, I mean, you, you can comment on anything that you want, but specifically, how, how has this affected your guys' operations here in Trinidad? Yeah, thanks, Javed. Well, as you know, we are halfway through uh, so far Touchwood successful exploration program, having drilled a, a couple of wells. Um, you know, we're applying for pipelines and CECs, and we were, you know, mid midstream into all of these endeavors, and now um, at the very, you know, one one aspect on the human resources. I mean, we have the our some of our drilling. Um, and some of our drilling team, they're, they're you know, self-isolating at home in Canada. Um, so it's, it's definitely affected, you know, our, our, our program and where we're at with that. Well, one thing I do want to say, though, as, um, uh, as a Calgary-based company and myself living uh, um, in British Columbia and traveling to Calgary and Trinidad, the company itself, I mean, we have embraced technology and we've actually, we're quite used to running our business um, via Skype and um, we do a lot of our meetings this way. We're able to, you know, very efficiently uh, uh, control the business that way. But you know, obviously this is unprecedented. Um, we're going to see an acceleration, I think, of a lot of things, acceleration of good things like green initiatives, but also an acceleration of um, bankruptcies, um, uh, uh, contraction and consolidation within the industries. We see this back in Calgary. Um, a lot of the smaller companies um, in the U.S., shale gas or, or, or shale and uh, multi-stage fracturing, they just can't sustain those, the, the current oil prices, obviously. So, but I, I am an eternal optimist, and I think there is a huge potential, um, you know, to, to um, embrace uh, different technologies and look at, uh, doing things a different way. Um, one thing I did want to point out is, you know, it has like the oil and gas industry is a very cyclical industry um, in 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 its own nature. Um, from you know, in seventy eight to eighty, where you had um, uh, Iran, the revolution in Iran and Iraq uh, invading Kuwait. Like throughout history, you've really seen. That, that oil and gas is a very cyclical business. I think Trinidad has been a little bit um, more isolated, like has been a little protected from that in that, uh, you know, you have a market in place and, and, and et cetera, but, but it is a very cyclical business. And I think that young professionals need to be aware of that, need to be prepared for that. Um, and I know you have a section on that, so we can chat about that afterwards, but... Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's an opportunity to be efficient and do things differently, obviously. Um, but on as far as Touchstone goes, I mean, like I say, we, we're, we're quite used to dealing with this um, from a human resources point of view and meeting and all of that. But, but definitely, we're midstream in the program and we're, we're really keen to get back at it and, and revitalize oil and gas for Trinidad. Great, Lynn. Thank you very much. Uh, Nisha, do you have any thoughts on, on what you think going to be short-term or long-term impacts, whether, whether it's in Trinidad or, or generally? Okay, so first off, let me start by piggybacking off um, what you guys said before. So as Lynn mentioned before, it's very cyclical, right? So it, what happens now, it, there'll be an upturn, then there'll be a downturn, then there'll be an upturn. And what I experienced is exactly that. In 2000 and, late 2015 into 2016, there was a downturn in Trinidad. And that was just about when I graduated with my BSc. So before you know you graduate and you're thinking, as soon as you come out of this, you're going to get a job, you're going to be good to go, you know, all these things. And then there was a downturn in our economy and a downturn in the energy sector, which is where I was focusing. And as well, as Mark mentioned in that long bio, he said before, I started my own energy blog and that downturn is what caused me to start that because I sat at home depressed. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to get a job. What is going to happen? And then I said to myself, you know what? 
I was fortunate enough to earn this degree I actually had. Let me put this to the test and let me see how I can make the best out of the situation. I started my master's and Kevin was one of my lecturers and I learned so much during that time of starting my master's. I said, you know what, let me start this blog. And that was how I made the best out of that opportunity. And I want everybody that's listening who's around my age, who's younger, and who may be about to experience these things, you know, it would feel like the end of the world at that point, and it would feel really tough, and it would feel really hard, and you will keep questioning, why did you do this degree? Why did you get into this sector? And I just want to tell you all, it's okay to feel that way, but don't let that get you into this place where you're sunk and you don't want to get out of it. You have so many resources available. You could do whatever. Technology is at the tip of our fingers. We can do anything. Look at us now. We're having a panel discussion on something that's happening within our, our communities, within our countries, within the globe, right? So I just want to say use this opportunity to level up to whatever you thought you couldn't do at a point. This is your time to make it happen. So that's, that's my first point I want to say. The second thing is, I think with us in Trinidad, we have so many things coming at us at once. So yes, we have lower commodity prices, right? So that means lower oil prices, lower gas prices. So what does that mean for us? We also have that coupled with lower production. So when we have lower production, that results in our downstream now being affected where, you know, a lot of plants are shutting down. We have Titan, which is a Methanex plant. We had Yara shutting down, one of, one of Yara plants shutting down. And these things are happening and it's like we're being, um, I don't want to say attacked because that's a really bad word, but we're, go we're, we're having to face this on many fronts. So I think we need to make the links now where we need to map this out. So, okay, we have lower commodity prices. We have low production. What does low production mean? Low production in natural gas means we have low production in methanol, low production in ammonia. What does that now mean for us? Low production in methanol and ammonia now means lower revenue. And our, we have a fossil fuel-based economy in Trinidad. So at this point, we need to have a game plan, right? And I think this is where us, again, I'm tying us. I, I don't want to say young people as a bad term. <laughs> I want to tie in young professionals into this where now we are faced with this. What are we going to do? How are we going to help? You might say, you know what, I'm not a part of the government. I'm not a part of any big multinational. How can I help? But if I thought that way, I wouldn't have started blogging. I wouldn't have started spreading knowledge that I had at that point. So how are you? I'm challenging you now as young professionals. How are we going to take the situation that we're in and make it better? Because 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to be the ones leading the country. How are we going to do that? So those are the two points I wanted to touch on. So I'll pass back to Javid now. Thank you very much, Nisha. And I think you 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 did some of the things that John and they were advising about. And, and it's really great, great stuff on that. Um, Kevin, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you see as the drilling forecast? Or do you see the drilling forecast change in a new region? Um, we know how many uh, drilling projects and rigs are supposed to be in Trinidad, Guyana, Suriname this year um, in, in our area. Do you see that changing or being delayed or continuing as normal? I think there's going to be some, um, some so in Trinidad, uh, my, I did a check today, some drilling programs are going to be delayed by a month or two. And the reason for that is that we close our borders and drilling rigs have to enter our country to, to drill. And those drilling rigs more than likely have foreigners working on them. And we've shut our borders to any foreigners entering our country. The same applies to Guyana. So um, in Trinidad, it's, going to, it's not going to cancel any drilling programs, but we, we may have some delays. And the companies, our, our country has been locked down until the 30th of April. So the companies are waiting to see what the government does on the 30th of April before they make a decision to send a rig all the way down to Trinidad. Um, with regard to, so that's Trinidad, you have, there's not much change except for some delays. In Guyana, we've had, um, we, according to Exxon's last investor, investor presentation, which was the 3rd of March of this year, 
Exxon's break-even Guyana is among the best break-evens for new capital projects. So when Exxon looks at the next five years, they are seeing their growth um, coming from Guyana and from the Permian Basin. So they recently made an announcement that they would cut CapEx. And uh, I don't think that cutting CapEx is going to affect Guyana. It's going to really affect their, their, their investments in the Permian Basin. And it may cause a delay in a LNG project that they are looking to invest in in Papua New Guinea. But I think Guyana, Lisa 1, Lisa 2, continue um, on schedule. There is, as we, we know, there is going to be a, a, a one-year phasing out of the start of investment in the Payara development. So um, that it hasn't stopped the Payara development. It's shifted the project out a bit. So it hasn't really affected um, Trinidad and Guyana so far. Um, Suriname, I do, Javed might know more about Suriname than me, but I don't think it's affected the, the drilling program for 2020. Um, Apache continues to be very optimistic about about their exploration in Block 53 in Suriname. And there's some other exploration was planned this year by um, Petronas plans to explore in Suriname this year. So with regard to our part of the world, it hasn't really affected drilling programs. Um, there are some labor supply issues in Guyana um, in that you know getting expats into the country and getting experts out of the country is going to be very difficult. So the real, the real disruption is really among, uh, uh, is really around for now, moving people across borders. Yep, yeah, I fully agree, Kevin. The biggest challenge that they have in offshore is basically crew changes. So on all the rigs that are active in the region, they are trying to keep the crews on as long as they can. Um, for HSE reasons, they won't be able to keep them on for more than a certain number of weeks, which they're trying to, you know, get up to right now. And yes, in Suriname, um, the drilling programs from uh, Petronas and Tolo that are so far unaffected, um, as far as we know. Uh, again, they may be delayed by a little bit, but the biggest challenge really is about getting crew in and out of these countries. Um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask Denise, do you see an opportunity for, like, say, operators where uh, prices of things like uh, rig and so on may, may fall drastically in this period? Uh, for those of you listening, I have a very small company and work with an operator in West Texas, and we have, we see two things. This is the first time since uh, the 50s and up to the late 70s where Texas is looking at allowables for wells, so the maximum efficient rate at which you can produce, but basically asking all operators to cut back their production. So that's it's been discussed. I've not seen any official information on that yet, but as a small independent, that really would affect us because our production numbers are not high to begin with. Um, in terms of rigs, uh, people are calling regularly looking for us to drill. Please keep our crews employed. And I think that's important. There's a very human effect to the virus and the low oil prices, and that is providing income for people that live paycheck to paycheck or live with manual labor. Um, this is a very serious thing, and so we are banking a number of projects and so when we can start drilling again. But the third, well, I'll add a third thing that's going to be effective, and that is um, there's no room in the pipelines onshore U.S. I'm in West Texas, and even though I'm in the eastern part and not in unconventionals, um, I, there's still no room to take the oil we're producing. So it is um, literally it's pay to take now, which is kind of frightening. That is, uh, if you want to keep producing your well, you may have to actually sell it at less, at a very, very low cost. In, in a sense, you're paying to produce your wells. And I'll, I'll end with this, that it's a real opportunity for small independents. All of you students out there, I'm going to challenge you. Pick a old oil field or gas field somewhere around the world and look at places for oil storage, gas storage, enhanced recovery, improved recovery, carbon capture storage, carbon capture use. The more we know about our old oil fields, the reservoir geology, and the connectivity, what we can do to store or actually do enhanced recovery, the more valuable our oil fields become. So I know that was, a, that was not my most eloquent speech there. Study old reservoirs, become a good development geologist, 
uh, really understand fluid flow through porous media, conventional fluid flow through porous media, because that is the next wave that's going to hit the oil and gas industry, is low-cost production, because we understand uh, fluid flow. Thanks. Great, great points, Denise. And I read something the other day that, that if the, the one oil and gas uh, part of the, the business that is that is doing great, great business is anybody that owns tankers and storage facilities. I hear those guys have increased their prices uh, by three and four and five times in the last month alone. Yeah. So I, I don't know if John you wanted to come back in and, and comment on anything to do with the industry in terms of um, in terms of changes that you see in whether it's on a technology front or anything like that. Let me just unmute myself, yeah. Um, no, look, pretty much I, I was uh, really smiling when Denise was talking about uh, understanding the rocks, the reservoirs, development, geology, storage of different fluids and gases. And I think that's, that's really where we need to go. Um, it's really, really sad that the human factor on the short term, I'll emphasize on the short term, is going to really, really be painful. Um, you know, just uh, all I could say is we've been through it before, and it's going to be tough. There's going to be time for sacrifice. There's going to have to be time for changing careers, albeit temporarily, to put the bread on the table. Um, and that's really, really the sad thing on the short term. But I'll reiterate what Denise was saying, what I was saying earlier, that I think on the long term, this really is going to be an opportunity, an opportunity to learn better and more efficient communication, learn better, more efficient um, job sharing, learn better and more efficient uh, uptake of industry standards. So, you know, it's painful. And this is pretty much what that article, I don't know how many of you had a chance to read those articles in the Explorer that I highlighted um, as, as a uh, pre-reading. But that's pretty much what, um, uh, you know, the, the author, um, what's his name, Kenneth Medlock, was saying in, in the first instance that it's, you know, called ripping off the Band-Aid. It's going to hurt, but in the long term, it's going to heal. And that's pretty much the message I would take away from this. All right. Thank you very much, John. So I wanted to, to go on to the next topic, which we kind of touched on a bit, but Susan is probably the best person to lead this discussion on, on technology, since she is the Director of Innovation and Emergent Science with AAPG. Susan, what do you think uh, technology, especially GNG technology, is going right now? Um, well, I'm, thank you, because that, this really flows with what John and, and um, Denise and also Nisha and, and Lisa were saying, that um, I believe that what we're seeing right now is um, an integration of technology, and a lot of it has to do with analytics, but also it has to do with the fundamentals. So I was talking to uh, our education committee and also people at, at Noble Energy and ExxonMobil and Helmer and Payne, and they were talking about how they're looking for people that have a sweet spot of skills and capabilities, and they tend to have a data science where they can do visualization of the reservoirs. Uh, Denise was talking about um, going back to old fields, well, reservoir characterization and visualization, and also understanding geochemistry and fluid flow, fracture patterns, um, migration. And then also, uh, we often don't think about this, but looking at systems and the supply chain, not just in terms of, 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 um, of like midstream or storage, but also in terms of drilling, where are those coming from? So looking at the whole kind of eco ecosystem, and I just wanted to point out too that uh, some people are using these, these skills right now to solve problems with, say, food supply. 
right now um, farmers are having to dump milk and some food is going to waste because they, they can't they're like plowing under and they can't get the food to the processing or to the market and there are people in the industry who are using their skills to solve those problems knowing that they're also translatable to um, to later to to the oil and gas industry so I think that um, the points made about do what you can to help and be useful and 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 also potentially help bring food to your table and to other people's tables, literally, could really be wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. I have a, a geology and geophysics related question. Uh, when you are <clears throat> doing uh, interpretation of data and planning wells and stuff like that, it's, very, it's a very hands-on, very interactive thing with the different teams in any company. Uh, and I just wanted to ask your guys' opinion on how you know, how easy is it to, to do interpretation of data, to discuss things, to look at maps, um, you know, to, to plan wells and discuss problems when, you, when you're actually not in the same room? Do you guys think that we can be as effective uh, like this or even more effective? Or what do you guys think about that one? We're learning. <laughs> we're all struggling with it, but we're learning. Javid, if you'll let me jump in here. Um, so, I may not be able to give you a perspective based on the geological side of it, but um, well, as you can see, both Javid and I look at ramps, and the content coordinator at ramps, and I'm attached to the marketing and communications department. So what we learned during this entire pandemic experience is that communication is probably the biggest driver to having operations happening efficiently and um, still actually happening because a lot of people had to close off their operations and that sort of stuff. So I'll give you an example of our plan of action. So the last day I was physically at work, which was the 13th of March, that was literally um, probably a month ago, we went into free lack of better term crisis mode. We said this is happening, it's real, and we need to get this information out by any means possible. So we went into crisis mode where we developed a content plan and we just started pushing out information about COVID, what is happening, how it's affecting our organization and that sort of stuff. And another thing we need to take into consideration is leadership in situations like this. We need leadership that steps in, um, reaffirms, um, encourages, and that sort of stuff so that when we have this work from home process, you actually have work from home because at, before, prior to COVID-19, a lot of organizations weren't um, really open to work from home because they weren't sure of their workforce if they were going to get productivity, that sort of stuff, right? And now that we're having to experience this trial by fire, basically, we're realizing that, you know what, you don't need to have to micromanage people and you don't have to look over, okay, so what's the update on this, what's going on, that kind of thing. You have to trust that your team is equipped to deal with this. And what I've realized from my personal experience is that this open forum of communication where you could go to somebody, you could talk to them, you could say, well, this is happening, how are we going to move forward from this? And from dealing with this for the past month, I could say at Rams, yes, we have our ups and downs. What we realized is that, is that my mic? Okay, no, it wasn't my mic. What I realized is by keeping this channel of communication open, it encourages staff and encourages team members more to participate and more to like basically get their work done and that's just from a communications and marketing perspective of things i guess somebody else could give a geological aspect on it now lynn well thank you very much nisha lynn what, what how, how have you guys you said you you guys are touched to and have already been using um you know you guys have communicated between Trinidad and calgary teams uh, already and you all you all already do this uh, you yes. have any tips for anybody else who might for the first time uh, actually be trying to do remote work, especially geological and geophysical work? Um, well, I mean, there's, you know, there's n numerous resources out there and um, 
um, definitely research those, but at the very least, I mean, I think you could get in touch with anybody on, on this panel, probably, um, myself, um, Zavi Moonen, like, we, we work through geological, geophysical um, data, um, if not on a daily basis, you know, d a, a few times throughout the week. It's, 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 it's actually almost more efficient. I mean, you know, there's nothing like putting a map on a big table and having everybody stand around and, and, you know, have their two cents on it. But, I mean, you can really do that. I mean, you can share your screen and go through seismic sections, go through mapping, logs. Um, it's, it's not hard to do. Um, so, uh, but again, as far as resources, you, I think if you, anybody in the, in the um, virtual audience, if they need any assistance, uh, you know, I would be more than willing, um, Zav would be more than willing, and I'm sure everybody on the panel. Um, what I'd like to say, though, um, a little bit maybe unre unrelated, but basically I think what, 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 COVID-19 um, and the situation right now has really identified um, is is balance or imbalance as it were and I know Kevin had mentioned something about this and um, you know I, I feel that we were out of balance as a society uh, whether it was in the energy sector Trinidad being you know um, fairly dependent on oil and gas um, Alberta same um, and I think that a balance is, um, is, is a big lesson that we should take away from this situation when you see supply chains cut off um, in, in Canada. I find actually there's a really good similarity of, between Trinidad and Canada. We, we have huge natural resources. Trinidad is one of the um, most abundant and natural resources out of all the Caribbean nation, um, having been, you know, attached to to South America, different, not carbonate, you know, but different soil, and you can grow everything there. I mean, diversification is key. Um, balance is something that we really need to take out of this, and if you're not balanced, you're unstable, and we're seeing that now. Um, Canada, we had to rely, you know, on the U.S. Um, and Trump, and I think he's doing a similar thing into some of the Caribbean nations, but um, denying the export of, of um, N95 masks into different countries. And we supply the U.S. with the pulp and paper for um, masks and surgical, you know, equipment and, and, and some of that. So we have those natural resources. We ship them somewhere else, and then we rely on um, them, you know, to buy it back, and and we need to practice self-sufficiency and diversification, and I think that's a really important lesson um, of coming out of this. Yeah, definitely, Lynn, and I think um, one of the things that Lead Caribbean is looking at more and more now is that food security is a big issue. Um, we, we import 90% of our food as a, the entire Caribbean from more or less from the U.S., and, and, and yet we can grow a lot more, but, um, you know, the, the, the supply chains have always been there and they've become cheaper. And now we have to look uh, local to see what we can actually supply. Mm -hmm. uh, what, I have a slightly different question for you guys, and, and it's something you mentioned there. You said uh, stuff that you and Zavi have been doing. I saw that Zavi has started some virtual field trips. Um, yeah. On, online. Um, so, and I know they've been done generally by different universities um, over the last couple of years, especially with drone technology and really high resolution cameras and stuff like that. I'll ask the, um, the APG folk, uh, are virtual field trips the future of field trips? Can we get more out of field trips possibly uh, in, in some cases uh, by doing them virtually? Oh, wow. I'm so glad you taught, asked that question. I was just having conversations with, like, for example, Art Donovan who does um, a field trip in West Texas, and he's going to do a, a field trip, um, a virtual field trip. And I was talking to Mike Stevenson, the British Geological Survey. So I've been talking, we've been, we definitely are going to offer virtual field trips. And then we've also made a list of resources where you can go in and kind of follow your own interactive field trip experience. We have links to that on our, in our Learn blog. So the short answer is yes. And I'll let John and Denise elaborate. Yes, I'll, I'll follow up with Susan. Um, AAPG is aware of Total's work to digitize global outcrops of significance uh, for analogies to subsurface fields. 
And so Total has the software. It's been featured at some of AAPG's annual conventions, both the ACE and the ICE. And I was looking forward to this June, so I'm still wondering if we'll be able to see it, uh, the progress they've made on virtual field trips, LIDAR, using light imaging and detection and ranging LIDAR uh, images of the outcrops, and then narrated uh, field trips and the ability for yourself to do these on your own, at your own pace, to zoom in and zoom out and really look at the, the stratigraphy, the stacking patterns, the, ch the, the large scale and small scale heterogeneities that, that make us better reservoir modelers in the subsurface. So follow Chotel. That sounds pretty cool. Pretty cool yeah. stuff. <laughs> John, you guys doing anything down in, um, in Adelaide uh, on that? Yeah, so look, I'm going to be contrarian on here, and I'm going to say that as good as our technology gets for doing virtual field trips, nothing is going to replace the opportunity to get there and look at the rocks and get your hands on the rocks, get dirty, and not to mention the interaction um, on the outcrop with, with people that you just can't do online. I think there's some wonderful opportunities for online short courses. I think there's wonderful opportunities for the uh, visiting geoscientist program. Um, and I think that for a virtual outcrop, you would have you would get a lot more out of it if you'd been there once in real life already. And I know it's contrarian to what a lot of people are doing. It's probably contrarian to what Total, what Denise was talking about, is doing. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I think nothing is going to replace the actual hands-on-the-rock opportunities. Sorry for saying that, if that offends anybody. No, I think, I think everybody would agree that nothing would ever replace seeing the rocks up close, but I think at least as a substitute, this might not be too bad considering, um, you know, considering yeah. the circumstances. Uh, John, yeah, John, I want, yeah, John, I want, to, I want to chime in that, yeah. actually, I'm going to go back. It is balance. It is getting out and seeing the rocks, but we always want to go back. We always want to see more. We always want to study more. So it is that balance, taking the actual field trip that are so good, there's so many opportunities with our local geological societies, our national geological society, our global geological societies. Get out and see the rocks, but follow up, do the detailed work, understand fluid flow, not just the rocks, but how fluid flows through those rocks. Thank you, John. And just to jump in really quickly, we are having our first um, synchronous um, live online course in um, machine learning today and tomorrow. We'll be repeating it and we'll have, we're, we're launching a series of online courses that we're offering in the mornings in, in central time. Or, well, we're trying to make it so that people around the world can take them and then we'll have a few in the evenings in Oklahoma so, or Houston so that Asia Pacific is in the morning. So the goal is to, to make them um, cutting the prices so that they're affordable and we and we also we will ha have the free um, DLs and VG uh, visiting uh, geologists, but we just really really want to do our part to to give people content. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, Susan, that 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 that's great stuff that you guys seem to be doing. I wanted to ask Kevin, um, as a your perspective as a lecturer. Um, on the MBA program, uh, how do you see the future of of, uh, of lecturing or of teaching in general? Uh, do you see that? It, do you think it's possible to, to move a lot of classes um, to remote uh, learning, like like what we're doing here? I mean, uh, online programs have existed for a while, but but what do you think? I don't know if Kevin is still there or if he got on mute again. Yeah, I was on mute for a little bit there. Um, first of all, I would say that no industry in the world was as prepared to communicate across borders, you know, um, across countries like the oil industry. I mean, we've been doing this now for probably over 20 years as an industry, so this is really nothing new to us. Um, with regard to higher education, online learning has always been a feature of um, of of 
of university life. So I, I think it's just going to ramp up now. And um, I mean, I don't know, and nobody knows when um, the world will return to normal. And it could be that um, what we will see is a sort of acceleration of what I call, what, what people call the fourth industrial revolution, which are, you know, all those technologies um, that are part of that fourth industrial revolution, things like drones and things like, you know, um, you know, blockchain and so on. And more, more online learning, more collaboration online. Unfortunately, you're going to lose the human touch. Um, as a lecturer, I prefer to be, you know, um, in front of a classroom with a whiteboard with three or four different color markers and drawing graphs and so on. Um, doing it, um, doing it using a platform like like Blackboard, or, or using any one of the the online um, tools that we have is is certainly very difficult to be as effective. I, I much prefer the whiteboard and the and the different color markers. Yeah, I agreed, and I, I you're right. It's it's accelerating how well we do things. Um, just about two weeks ago in our office, we had we had a staff meeting of 150 people, all on Microsoft Teams, um, and it worked really well. Just like just like how this is going, and it's something that we would not have even considered possible um, a month or two ago. I don't even think that we in YP would have thought that we would try a web session like this and expect to have 50 people online and, and, and actually think that we'll be able to hear everybody properly and actually have good discussions going. So it's forced us, I guess, which is, which is a good thing. Yeah. Let me come in on that because, you know, I am right on the front line uh, in, in the educational system here. And after I get off the line with you guys, I'm teaching a class on reservoir geology. And uh, this is the uh, day three of the class and um, you know everyone is doing projects and I give assignments and I even have quizzes online and the students respond with the quizzes. We've even got on Zoom a uh, breakout room so I can assign uh, students and put them onto teams to work specific projects together. So it seems to work. I agree with Kevin, it's nowhere near the same as the in-person the red, black, and blue, and green markers on the whiteboard. But, you know, this is one of the things that works to me really, really quite well. And this is one of the things that's going to revolutionize the educational sector once we get out of you know, the coronavirus um, crazies that we're in. Great, John. Thank you very much. So as we get into the last couple of minutes, we wanted to we wanted to kind of wrap up on with some positive good suggestions. And we could probably combine that with some suggestions for for young professionals and university students. We already touched on some of them in terms of looking at new opportunities, use the free online courses, um, try to get some new skills out of this or, or, or things like that, but uh, anybody has any different perspectives or any other suggestions or solutions that they see? It doesn't have to just be in terms of students, but just generally. Um, I really liked what Lynn was saying about the balance and returning to balance. So when we're talking, I like John's description of how he's teaching, so like that's kind of global, global reach, but then the local, we have to think locally again about um, connections with our communities and thinking locally in terms of energy, but the entire supply chain. So, you know, however we do that, I think that we are going to be changed dramatically because we have to think locally and globally. Okay. But Lynn, I was really fascinated by your thoughts. Did you have more? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I, again, I, I'm really, I, I really believe in being self-sustainable and, and balance. Um, so I lived in Calgary for over 25 years. I actually was born out east, but I moved to British Columbia about five years ago because I wanted to be more self-sufficient, just as a, an individual. Um, I'm so blessed because um, Touchstone is a kind of company where they believe in balance and, and, and environment and self-sustainability and things like that. And so they were 
um, quite supportive of that. But um, And I actually just talked to uh, our president the other day about starting a community garden in, in our touchdown, uh, touchstone compound, which he was all for. Um, but yeah, I mean, on a, on a very individual basis, we can grow gardens in containers on your front porch. Um, you can you can do a lot of things that can uh, you know just help the environment, but also just you know help yourself. Throughout my valley in the past little while, we've seen hoarding and people buying surplus to the point where the shelves were bare. In my little community here, people actually, they grow their tomatoes, they grow, they, we grow everything. And so we can those, you know, when the weather gets cold so that we have tomato sauce on the shelf. You just have to be, you know, um, able to self-sustain at, at an individual level. Um, and as a country, I think that's really important. Um, but uh, one thing I would say to the younger uh, generation um, and you, you guys have been doing a fabulous job by the way I mean we just uh, attended a, a virtual AAPG YP session on artificial intelligence uh, I guess that was like last week or the week before um, so some really great things coming out of that and I would encourage you to 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 um, you know expand upon upon that kind of thing I mean um, yeah, there's and there's so many resources again out there. Um, in Trinidad, I know they have a number of different uh, um, resources as far as like starting community gardens or having your own thing. Um, so just, but, but yeah, again, I mean, balance is is key, and 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 I think change also it has to be um, economically viable and socially acceptable and and sustainable for it to actually take hold. Um, and I, you know what, I think I've seen like this trend, I'm not sure if you've seen it in Trinidad, but even if you look to, to television and stuff, you see living off grid, um, my homestead rescue, like I think, like I see this in North America, there, there's a trend of people, younger people, families going back to um, being self-sufficient in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, well, some of my thoughts on that. The, the trend we notice here in Trinidad is that everybody is all of a sudden a very good chef, and they're cooking <laughs> every single day, and they're cooking really yeah. well. So that's yeah. one thing that they definitely are learning more about feeding yeah. themselves, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, I don't know. You're trying to make any double something yet? Everybody else is doing it. <laughs> no, no, no. What we, 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 we before the ban on 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 catering doubles, we we did cater doubles. Okay. Um, doubles is a is the, the most famous street food in Trinidad, and it was banned about uh, two weeks ago, and it's caused great, great um, you know, unhappiness in Trinidad. So, so Kevin and Nisha, uh, you, uh, you guys, I mean, if you came out of, of school in the last in, out of university in the last two or three years in the oil industry, it came out in a pretty difficult time, 2016, 17, 18, and things finally looking up in 2019 and 20, the prices started stabilizing, companies started hiring again, drilling projects are going, rigs are busy again, and then this happens, right, and it all goes back down probably even below where it was before. What, what I, I, you guys suggested some things, but what, what do you, you know, how do you, how, how do you keep motivated as a young person coming out and dealing with these things? Um, do they have a few, do you? persist and, and, and stay in the industry or what, what should they be looking at? I um I'll give again my personal um, opinion on it. So I think that if it's something that you are truly invested in, meaning that you didn't just choose this industry off of a whim, it's something that you want to be impactful on and it's something that you're really passionate about, I suggest that you do stick it out because I think that we all have a role to play and everything we have to contribute will be beneficial in one way or the other. Um, I think with regards to this lull that you might experience now, not everybody has the same path. So not something that I do would work for Kevin, not something Kevin do would work for Javid, and so on and so on, right? So what I would suggest that could be used by anyone at this point in time, if you're out of a job or if you're seeking a job in the future or whatever, yes, it's going to be a difficult time. But apart from, yes, 
doing these online courses and these sort of stuff. You have so much stuff that is available to you. Something as simple as LinkedIn. Get into your LinkedIn, get into networking yourself because use this time now that you have free time. Do a article, do a blog piece, do something like this and start an active discussion amongst yourself, amongst your peers when you know that, you, like when you, as they said before, when you go into a job interview and somebody asks you, so what did you do when this COVID-19 pandemic was happening, you're not going to say, well, I was just watching Netflix, right? You want to create some sort of active discussion, network yourself. And I challenge you to go a step further. And why not mentor someone? Why not try to improve the life of someone around you? Where, you know, in Trinidad and around the world right now, school has been closed off. So you might have a little brother, a little sister, somebody in your community. You know, you could give back in such a way where you could help them out with work or somebody might reach out to you and say, you know what, you have any suggestions about this? It's all about networking and collaboration because at this point in time, the only way we could get through this entire situation is together. And that's just my personal perspective on it. No, fully agreed, um, Nisha. And one of the suggestions I always give to young people, especially when they're looking for jobs or they're still in school and they have time, write a technical paper. Spend some time. And, and sit down and write a technical paper and submit it to AAPG, submit it to SPE, submit it to one of these institutions, um, partner up with somebody, it could be a lecturer, it could be somebody you work with, somebody you know in your industry, and write some papers. They said John wrote 150 papers. I don't know when John wrote 150 papers, but I mean, it probably, he seems to enjoy it, so maybe you can give some tips on that. <laughs> I've had many years to do that. <laughs> 150 papers weren't written last month. <laughs> Good. I, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if Susan or Kevin or anybody else has any, you know, last comments in terms of suggestions generally for anybody. Yes, yeah, so I think. Um, I just want to say one thing. I think okay. what is very valuable is uh, employees who have expertise in multiple areas. So you find sometimes a person is very pigeonholed into into you know geology but if you can find a geologist who has an understanding of the economics or the the contracts um then you become a lot more valuable to your organization um if you could find a geologist who could you know sit down in a presentation and go through the financials of the company and going and learning those things um is not that difficult and as everybody says, there's a lot of online stuff you could learn now. So I'm I'm using this time to teach myself German. Um, I've always wanted to learn German, and um, so I'm you know I'm getting along pretty well with um, the online. There's a lot of free online courses you could use, and then beyond that, you have to pay. <laughs> there's a point here between these online things that you have to you, you you have to pay at some point in time, but you know yeah. we'll get there. Um, if you don't mind, Javid, I just want to say, like what Kevin mentioned there about, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself. And I think that's pretty key. Like as, um, as you know, even on my day-to-day -day now, I mean, I try to learn as much as I can on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, they say, you know, life's a, a, a game of luck. But really, the harder you prepare, the luckier you get, right? So, I mean, I, I encourage everybody to, you know, take, take advantage of those resources and look at all the different aspects of the industry because you never know where the path is going to lead you. Um, there's a million different paths that could lead to whatever your goal is, whether that's just, you know, happy health and happiness or, or whatever. But, um, yeah, just stay open-minded and, and, uh, you know, if you do work for a company and you have access to, to, um, data map stuff up if you have stuff from school that you know whatever like i used to pra i used to just map stuff up uh for fun basically and and to see you know what i would get out of it but just keep learning keep keep um absorbing as much as you can and 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 don't pigeonhole yourself you know oh i'm a petroleum geologist and that's it look into broader um perspectives and aspects of of your industry 
great, great stuff, Lynn. And 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 I I think that that has really good points from you and Kevin in terms of not pigeonholing yourselves. Um, Kevin. Yes. I is there time for one more comment? Yeah, sure, definitely. Yes. Um, one, I want to appreciate the comments about mentoring. I there's nothing more important than connecting. We learn from you as much as you learn from us. So thank you for that. And diversifying your skill set. There's no time like the present to be more diverse. If you love geology, pick up a second skill set. And I would say engineering is, ex geological engineers are very valuable right now. Also, mach obviously, machine learning, Python, another language, great suggestion. So I wanted to reinforce that. But I'm going to put a challenge out there to those of you who are still on the line. What are you going to do? Petroleum is a vital resource for our economies, for our quality of life, for making sure the world is a better place. So what are you going to do to make it better? And I'm going to make some suggestions just from the point of AAPG. Um, AAPG, please take the time and update your AAPG profile. It's how we find you. It's how we know you're interested in more employment, or maybe in a short course, or being a speaker. Also do the same on LinkedIn. Second, take some time and go to the Division of Professional Affairs. There are a number of videos out there. And you can look at the discovery thinking and legends and geology. Those are very good resources to motivate you on what you could do to be a better exploration or petroleum geologist. Um, the third thing is, I, I'm going to challenge this. Put together your own AAPG search and discovery playlist. Now, I know it's not music, but geology is a beautiful language. And put together the three to five talks or 10 talks or five or 10 search and discovery papers that make a beautiful album, if you will. So that's a challenge to you all out there. And the last, Susan Nash, we need to put together a Reservoir Development Geology Hackathon. It is time to up. We have to update the Reservoir Geology Manual. And John Absolutely. Caldy and Susan Nash and everyone on this line, let's make it a global event. And I think the LACR, the Latin American and Caribbean region, could lead this. And if we start it, everybody will follow. So those are my things. Just remember, what are you going to do? And each and every one of us, when we work together, we can really affect change. And we have seen this. If, if we've learned only one thing from the COVID virus, when we work together, we make things better. Thanks. Great, guys. And I want to say that we, we've exactly one hour into the discussion, which is good timing. I hope that all the panelists feel that they've been adequately engaged. I hope all the people listening um, learn something or heard something that is always valuable. We had approximately 50, 50 participants for the duration of the talk, um, which is which is pretty good, I think. Um, and I see Xavier reminding us to follow AAPGYP Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter and also on Facebook and on Instagram. There's tons and tons of really good stuff coming out of the um, of the YP here. Um, and of course, as as Denise mentioned join AAPG globally and follow the various different pages on social media stuff. You'll, you'll get access to a lot of different things. You'll see a lot of great talks. Um, you'll make good connections. Um, you know, join LinkedIn, as some, some, some people said as well. Um, all great suggestions. And yeah, I think, I think um, we, we basically can leave it at that. Um, Chanel says, look out for our ne next technical talk next week. Um, I guess they'll email out what that's going to be like. Um, and the great thing about all these sessions is that they're completely free, I think. Yes, they are completely free. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, definitely really, really appreciate you guys in all these different time zones taking out time out of your day, uh, especially people like John who has to go and teach now to, um, you know, to, to chat with us for a bit like this. I really appreciate it. And um, it's, been, it's been pretty good from, from my end. All right, and we look forward to the next one, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. This yes, is great. Thanks. Yeah, so thanks so make much. the world a better okay, place. Okay, bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> bye, all. Take care. Stay safe. <laughs> yeah. Sequestered. Everyone's getting sequestered. <laughs> Self-sequestered. Yes, they're disappearing. Bye. All right, bye, take bye. care. <laughs>